question. Hi, my name is Salome. Welcome to the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. I'm 15 years old and I'm a student at Shades Valley High School. Hi, my name is Shelby Arrington. I'm 17 years old and I go to Ramsey High School. Hi, my name is Emily King. I'm 16 years old and I go to Mountain Brook High School. Hey, I'm John Decker. I'm 17 years old. I go to Mountain Brook High School. Hello, my name is Randall Gibbons. I am 15 years old and I'm a student at A.H. Parker High School. Hi, my name is Jatera Kamaris. I'm 14 years old and I'm a student at Best Mercedes High School. Hey, I'm Margo. I'm 17 years old and I go to Mountain Brook High School. Hi there, I'm Daniel. I'm 17 years old and I go to Homewood High School. Hi, my name is Courtney. I'm 15 years old and I attend Alabama Virtual Academy. All right, my name is Shania Plum. I'm 17 years old and I go to Ramsey High School. I'm Elephant Spandau. I'm 17 years old and I go to Mountain Brook High School. Hi, my name is Sydney Cook. I'm 16 years old and I go to Ramsey High School. Hi, I'm Salo. Again, welcome to the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. In 1896, the Supreme Court handed down Plessy versus Ferguson, which mandated that separate but equal would be the law of the land. Because of this, African Americans and other people of color faced barriers throughout the South, in Birmingham, and across the country. One of the first instances of barriers was the water fountains. We had water fountains for whites and water fountains for African Americans and other people of color. The water fountains for whites, what looked like an actual water fountain, it's clean, the water is cold. While the water fountain for people of color is rusty, it looks more like a sink than a water fountain, and the pipes are exposed, which meant that in the summertime, when it got hot outside in places like Birmingham, the water wouldn't be as cool as it was in the water fountains for whites. Right here, this is the replica of a bus in this time period. And in front of me, this is the section for the whites, and behind me, this is the section for the blacks. And if a white person did not have anywhere to sit, a black person would have to give up their seat so uh, the bus the bus driver had the right to move this display right here um so it could separate the blacks from the whites if the white person didn't have a seat and also um to pay well for a black person to pay uh, to get on the bus they would have to go at the beginning of the bus where the bus driver is and they would have to exit the bus in front of the bus and then go to the rear to go to their section of the bus Although segregation was the law of the land in the U.S., segregation looked different in the North and West versus in the South. In the North, we had de facto segregation, which was segregation by custom. People just knew their place. In the South, we had de jure segregation, where it was mandated by law for Blacks and Whites to be separated. One of the ordinances in Birmingham of the Jim Crow laws were the separation of races, of races in business. It said it shall be unlawful to conduct a restaurant or other place for the serving of food in the city at which white and colored people are served in the same room, unless such white and colored people are effectually separated by a solid partition extending from the floor upward to a distance of seven feet or higher, and unless a separate entrance from the street is provided for each compartment. Here we have an African-American young lady who was unable to enter the ice cream parlor because of the rule of African-Americans and whites to be separated as much as possible. As I showed earlier in the Jim Crow laws, they passed the seven foot wall ordinance, as you can see here, where African-Americans and whites were able to dine at the same establishments, but they also had to have separate entrances. So they created seven foot partitions or upstairs and downstairs areas for African-Americans and whites to continue to be separated in their establishments because businesses cannot flourish without all the dollars. Another place where African Americans faced discrimination was in the workplace. Birmingham is called the Magic City because it's, it was one of the only places where they had the three ingredients to make steel, iron ore, coal, and limestone. Although African Americans made up 65% of the steel industry, they were paid at a significantly lower rate. The convict leasing system also became a large part of this industry. There was something called vacancy laws, which were small laws that they used to imprison people of color. Laws like you couldn't spit on the sidewalk before noon, look at, touching a white person also meant looking them in their eyes. So you couldn't look a white person in their eye, you could be arrested for that, and you couldn't be unemployed. If you were unemployed and you didn't have $15 on you at the time you, you were stopped, you could be thrown into jail and subject to involuntary servitude or hard labor through the convict leasing system. They used this to continue to imprison many African-Americans and other people of color. Right here in act is Plessy v. Ferguson Verdict, separate but equal. 
But as you see in a little bit, it'll be separate and unequal. Here you have the white classroom. And it looks very nice, brand new. You have new books, new desk. The court is nice and you have advanced technology. Right here you have the black classroom. They got less money than the white classroom. As you see, they have old desks, no books, no technology at all because everything they got were handy. Black teachers had twice as many students than white teachers, which made their regular learning day extended from morning to night. They had to split up classes in order to give black students an effective education. The unequal part about this too is that only black students had the access to 10th grade only. You go all the way up to 10th grade. They did not have access to a high school diploma until Reverend Pitiful came up to the board, Birmingham Board of Education in plea of allowing black students to have high school access. With, among this world was Dr. Samuel Orton, and he understood the plea of Reverend Pitiful as he himself was a Jew, and he understood how to be outcast of society. With this plea, they came to the verdict and created the first black all four year high school, which gave access to their, their high school diploma. And when they got industrial high school, now known as A.H. Parker, it was known by any magazine as the largest Negro high school in the world at this time. All right, in the Carver Theater, and the Carver Theater was one of the theaters in the Chitlin Circuit. And the Chitlin Circuit got its name from slavery time. And in slavery time, foods such as chitlins, oxtails, and watermelon, they were known as less than food. Theaters weren't the only place where artists, they would come and perform. They also perform on football fields. And this leads me to John Fess Watley. John Fess Watley was a band director at Industrial High School, which is now known as Edge Parker. His former student, Erskine Ramsey Hawkins, he was very known for his joint name, Tocito Junction. And his students, well, John Fitz Watley's students, they wanted to actually perform Tocito Junction. He would not allow them to until, you know, they kept pleading him and pleading him. And one time at their performance, they um, added dance moves to their uh, performance and they noticed how much um, attention they were getting from it. And this leads us into um, many HBCUs and the Black community invading um, Showtime shows. And this leads us into the Magic City, as we now know, as ASU and A&M, they compete head-to-head -head in a dance time showcase. And I am myself a dance girl, and without John Fitz Wiley and his students, I wouldn't be a dance girl that I am at Ramsey High School. Right now we're in the church. The church is the heart of the movement, as many of the leaders were pastors, ministers, as their livelihood depended on the church and the great community. The church was a safe haven for many of the African Americans, and not only Birmingham, but really in the South, as this was the one or two times in the week where they felt the most respected. Another thing about the movement is the formation of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. This organization was created when they found out that Rosa Parks was part of the NAACP. And she was creating a lot of ruckus about the Montgomery Boy Bus Cut. When they found out that she was making all the ruckus, they demanded from the NAACP to hand over their list of members in Alabama. But the NAACP, keeping confidentiality, refused. So then Alabama government took the NAACP to court and it went all the way to Supreme Court the judge ruled in favor of the NAACP, which denied Alabama government the access to get the list from the NAACP. They said, okay, we're just gonna ban the NAACP from Alabama. So they walk in on a meeting that Fred Shelsworth was um, hosting and said, this organization has been banned from Alabama and you must dismiss with this organization now as it is against the law. So right then and there, Fred Shuttleworth found the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. When he found that organization, he pushed for desegregating the buses in Montgomery. That led to his house and his church being bombed on Christmas Day of 1956. And Fred Shuttleworth Church, Bethel Baptist Church, which is right behind me, only accepted people who were registered to vote in their auxiliary. As First Congregational Church, really broke the law as they were not allowed to integrate in a place as they had an integrated congregation. Now all around me are artifacts from different churches around them. Right here is the full pigs in the Bible from Bethel Baptist Church that Fred Schoenberg once used. Right here is the Street Baptist Church original pew. 
And then as you see up there, it's the 32nd Street Baptist Church Fame Glass Window, where Aretha Franklin started her singing career as her father passed through that church. Hi, I'm Emily. Before we head into the shotgun house, I just want to point some things out on this picture. Right here is Kelly Ingram Park, where the children's marches took place in 1963. This here is 16th Street Baptist Church, which was bombed in 1963, killing four little girls. And right here is where the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute stands today. This is called a shotgun house. It's so called because there was a long hallway that ran from the front door to the back door. So you could stand at the front door, fire a shotgun, and the bullet would go straight through to the back door. Shotgun houses are known for being very small and cramped like this one. For example, Fred Shuttlesworth was the oldest of nine children, and he had two parents. That's 11 people living in a space like this. But if you look around this shotgun house, you'll see fancy wallpaper, nice family portraits, these lovely lace curtains, nice furniture. And this family is obviously well, relatively well off. So why would they choose to live in such a small, cramped space for their family? That's because of zoning laws. As you'll see on this map, people of color could only live on, in these black areas on the map. That accounted for about 11% of available city land. The problem arises when you realize that 43% of the city's population were people of color, forcing half of the city's population into one-tenth of the available land. They had no choice but to live in small shotgun houses like this one. Of course, these zoning laws didn't just apply to housing, but to commercial venues as well. In the city of Birmingham, all businesses supporting the black community had to exist between 3rd and 5th Avenues North and 16th to 18th Street. This area was collectively known as the 4th Avenue Business District, and all businesses that would serve the black community could be found here hotels, restaurants, department stores, everything. One of the most important business people in Birmingham, Alabama was the man by the name of Arthur George Gaston, more commonly known as A.G. Gaston. He was the first black millionaire in Alabama and one of the first black millionaires in the entire United States. He was a master businessman who when he saw that there was a need for a business in the community, he would fill it. He owned a bottling company, a radio station, a life insurance company, a cemetery, and a funeral home. Because of those last three, people often said that he had to cover from the crib to the grave. Another important businessman in Birmingham, Alabama, was a barber by the name of Mr. James Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong was important for two reasons. First, he was Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's barber. This was the chair that Martin Luther King would sit in every time he came to Birmingham to get his hair, when he would get his hair cut. Martin Luther King thought it was important to go to the bar shop for two reasons. First, he didn't want people to see him as a sort of deified figure that would lead them off to safety, but rather as a human who is leading the movement that they were all a part of. He also wanted to establish a personal connection to the people and the communities he was working in so that he knew what he was fighting for and what they were fighting for. In 1954, the court case Brown versus Board of Edu Education finally proved that separate could not be equal. Now, that's not to say that no court case ever challenged the doctrine set forth in Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. For example, in 1899, a group of black parents in Richmond County sued their Board of Education for introducing a tax that would only benefit white schools in the area. However, the Supreme Court held that this tax was constitutional and follow the doctrine separate but equal. In 1927, in the court case of Gawloon versus Rice, the Supreme Court held that nine-year-old Martha Loom, a Chinese American, could not attend the white school in her neighborhood because she could not be classified as a white person. She would have to choose between attending the school for people of color or staying home and not going to school at all. This court case not only upheld Plessy versus Ferguson, but also extended it to all people of color, not just black people. However, in the 1954 court case Brown versus Board of Education, psychological research done by doctors Kenneth and Mamie Clark was used to prove that separate but equal was not true in the classroom. 
This research consisted of Dr. Clark showing two dolls to a series of black school children. One doll was white and one doll was black. In almost every case, the black school children would choose to play with the white doll because through segregation, they were taught that white children were better than black children and that separate was not equal. The reason this court case is so important is because it really didn't just apply to this classroom. If separate but equal didn't hold in the schoolhouse, how could it hold in movie theaters, in restaurants, in churches, in the buses? And that's what starts our movement. So as we all know, throughout history, the media has been very influential in perpetuating stereotypes about certain groups of people. Um, these stereotypes could be about more than, and it could be multiple different groups. The Jewish community has fallen victim to stereotypes, Native Americans have fallen victim, and many others have fallen victim. Uh, but right now we're going to be focusing on stereotypes about African Americans. And as times evolved and African Americans got roles in acting, whether it be on stage, in theater, or on television, uh, the people in charge of them who were, who were predominantly white forced these actors, these black actors and actresses, to, uh, to, make, to reinforce stereotypes about their own race. And the majority of the time, if not all the time, these stereotypes were extremely negative and had negative connotations. So as we look into this with, uh, on, for men and stereotypes, we can look and we can see the Samba doll. The Samba doll was a doll, he was a character, he was happy-go-lucky, he was always giddy, dancing around, singing. And they really, they used him to mock African Americans. We can also look at Burt Williams. He was an actor, he was 15, 16 white, but he identified as black, so he played the role as black men in, um, in films and in plays. And him, along with many other men who acted, uh, they would perform blackface, they would paint their lips to make them look bigger, and they would slouch up and make themselves appear non-threatening. And this was just so that the white people in the audience would feel more comfortable, and it made the, it made the African Americans seem lesser. And so over time, people began to see African Americans as lesser, and obviously you could see the development of the stereotype. Furthermore, we have Jim Crow. Jim Crow was a character developed by Thomas Rice in the 1800s. And Jim Crow, he had a song called Jumping Jim Crow. And it was pretty much, it was performed by white actors who performed blackface. And they would jump around dancing, hoop holler, and all this just to degrade African American culture and make fun of them. And you can see Jim Crow, we recognize that name. It's like the same name given to the ordinances of segregation in the South 100 years later. So let's shift gears again and focus back on women and what stereotypes of African American women. So right here on our left, we have Mandy, or Aunt Jemima, as most of us know her. And we've seen that on the news recently. We understand the controversy. But it's important to look deeper into this. So Mandy was a very stoic figure. She was very large, fat. She always had a grin on her face. So remember the grin. But let's look a little deeper here. She always has her hair covered. She never wears makeup to highlight her feminine qualities. And she's always dressed as a servant. And they did this for one specific reason. They wanted her to look like the same slaves that would feed and cook for the plantation owner and his family back before slavery was abolished. And it's important to understand that this is just a continuation of the stereotype we mentioned earlier, just to convince people that African Americans were, were inferior to white people, which is wrong. And it's important to realize that as we continue, you'll see that stereotype that people will have to break. But also, what's arguably more important to realize is that Mandy is always smiling. Just as the Samba doll is always smiling, he's giddy, Burt Williams smiles, and this is for one reason. Not only did uh, white people perpetuate the stereotype that African Americans were inferior, but they always showed them smiling to make it seem like they were better off because of it, that they were happy that they were below the standard of living for white people, which is plain wrong. And it's important to understand that these are the same stereotypes that African Americans are gonna have to strive to break. They're gonna have to break these stereotypes in the name of equality because they can get all the court cases they want and they can fight for equality in the courtroom and they wanna be, and to be equal under the eyes of law is very important but it's just important to be equal under the eyes of man. And so breaking these stereotypes is very important and take that into account as Randall continues with a confrontation. Hello, my name is Randall Gibbons and welcome to the confrontation zone. As you can see, there are many glass frames with portraits of people on there. And this is also talking about confrontation. It's telling you what confrontation is and what this gallery is about. In this display right here, you can see a row, cross, and a shovel. If you can see the flag, that says Birmingham. It lasted from the late 1940s to the mid-1960s. Birmingham was given this artificial name due to the immediate bombings happening over here in Birmingham. 
and there was something along with Bombing Hill called Dynamite Hill. Dynamite Hill was a street where on the left side you had white white people houses and to the right side you had black people houses. And why that was called Dynamite Hill was because of the many unsolved bombings happening over there in that street. Hi, I'm Jeterica Morris, and today I'll be talking about the movement gathering. If, as you can see, we have a, an inclined walkway, and this inclined walkway represents the uphill battle that people of color have to face every single day of their lives. Now you can see we have a very detailed timeline from 1954 to present day. If the black is white, it represents civil rights. This plaque right here talks about the Little Rock Nine, where 1,000 paratroopers had to escort nine black children into school just to ensure their safety. This specific picture represents Elizabeth Eckford being taunted by the entire school just because of her skin color. If the flag is gray, it represents something political. Political can mean a court case, a law being passed, or an election. This flag shows the election of Bull Connor for the position of public safety commissioner from the year 1957 up until 1963. He also held this position from 1937 to 1963, and for some people, let us consider a lifetime. If the flag is black, it shows a murder. This is the murder of Emmett Till. He was murdered August 28, 1955, by members of the Ku Klux Klan for allegedly whistling at a white woman. To show the world what happened to him, his mother decided to have an open casket funeral. And to show the displeasure, women started refusing to give up their seat on the bus one day. And this brings us to the Montgomery Bus Boycott. The Montgomery Bus Boycott led to 381 days. It started December 5th, 1955, and it ended December 20th, 1956. This boycott was to end segregated seating on buses. The only way to abolish this law was the case Bradley versus Gale. Bradley versus Gale was established November 13, 1956. Even after this law was abolished, people of color decided to still boycott the buses just to show how upset they were. This led the city of Montgomery to go into debt, and this also shows how big of a difference people of color had on the economy. Now, Rosa Parks may have been the one to spark the Montgomery bus boycott, but all of these women have played a part in starting. Claudette Colvin was the first woman to refuse to give up her seat, and she was only 15 years old. And I'm 14 years old, so that shows just how courageous she was. Joanne Robinson was an English professor at Alabama State College. She called for a one-day boycott, but that one-day boycott became a 381-day boycott due to the help of Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks was portrayed as a tired seamstress who was very quiet and very mellow, but that wasn't the case at all. Matter of fact, her feet weren't even hurting. Rosa Parks fought for women's rights, so women felt like it was their responsibility to defend her in any way possible. Rosa Parks had to ride the bus three times in order to be arrested. So she set foot on that bus planning to be arrested, and she planned on starting a movement. Through this movement, led by women, the world became familiar with Martin Luther King Jr. Hey, it's Margo again. 1960 starts the sit-in movement. The first sit-in was in Greensboro, North Carolina, when students of SNCC, or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, went to the Woolworths Whites Only Counter. Although this counter was called the Whites Only Counter, this was not its legal name. The court case Heart of Atlanta Motel versus United States states that business reigns over race. So if people have the money for the items served at the counter, they can order stuff. Although what these students were doing was completely legal, white people would still come in and assault them with, by throwing food at them, punching them, kicking them, and pictures of this went into the media. So this movement spread like wildfire in four months in over 78 cities. Another influential court case at this time was the New York Times versus Sullivan. The New York Times came to Birmingham and interviewed Fred Shuttlesworth to see what he thought of Birmingham. Obviously, he called it a racist city. But Bull Connor and Sullivan were not happy about this answer that he gave. When the article Fear and Hatred Garrett Birmingham came out, Connor and Sullivan were not very happy with the review of Birmingham given in the article. They sued the New York Times for libel and said that Fred Shuttlesworth and the New York Times were intentionally trying to bring Birmingham down. The New York Times won the case and it was a huge win for the civil rights movement because it meant what was actually happening in the movement could be reported in the press.
1960 was also the year that Fred Shuttlesworth filed his first of many lawsuits. This first lawsuit was when he sued the Birmingham airport for not offering him service. It is similar to the Heart of Atlanta Motel versus United States case because a business was not giving service to somebody who could pay for the service. Hello, it's Daniel again. Here we are at Bus Ride to Freedom. If you look here at the broken glass, this signifies danger ahead. If you'll follow me, we'll see that. By 1961, the federal government had already deemed interstate bus segregation illegal. However, in the South, it wasn't enforced. What this meant was, as soon as buses coming from the North and Northern states passed the Mason-Dixon line, they still had to segregate. So as soon as a bus crossed the Mason-Dixon line, they had to put up a curtain between African-American and white passengers and bus stops in the South were still segregated between black and white people. Because this was illegal, protesters in the North decided that they wanted to start the Freedom Rides, which was for them to follow a route starting in Washington, D.C. and heading all the way down to New Orleans. The Congress of Racial Equality, led by James Farmer, was the initial group to start this movement. So in the North, both black and white protesters began their bus travels in Washington, D.C. It's important that we recognize that this was a multiracial coalition of protesters. This is important because up to this point, mostly the people fighting for civil rights were only African-American. The Montgomery bus boycotts, the sit-ins in the South, these were not multiracial up until this point. The reason why this is worth noting is because having white people along uh, for the fight against racism and discrimination showed the entire country that on one side you have racists who are only white, and on the other side you have the people fighting for civil rights who are both black and white, and it shows pretty clearly which side is uh, the one to be on. So from Washington DC all the way through Atlanta, the Congress of Racial Equality led by James Farmer was traveling. However, in Atlanta, James Farmer's mother died, so he had to leave. Um, in Atlanta, we have Martin Luther King Jr. meeting with the Freedom Riders and telling them, the farther you go into the South, the more dangerous it's gonna be. I really recommend that you turn around. And we have people like Diane Nash, another prominent civil rights leader, telling him these bus riders in Washington DC wrote their final will and testimonies. They knew what they were getting into and they were willing to, to fight this fight. Picking up in Atlanta was John Lewis and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which continued the journey after James Farmer had to leave. The first um, major event, violent event that occurred was in Aniston, when a, a bus of Freedom Riders was stopped by the KKK and they were pulled out of the bus and the bus was burned. Luckily, no one was, no one was killed, but actually, when they were lighting the Molotov cocktails to throw it onto the bus, the KKK was trying to push the doors shut and the uh, state police officers had to step in and let the people out so that they wouldn't have been burned in the, in the massive fire that followed. So after Aniston, the Greyhound buses, which they had been using, were replaced by Trailways buses, which was another company that was helping the journey. As they arrived in Birmingham, they were met with fierce violence from the citizens of the city and Bull Connor, the public safety commissioner, told, uh, told reporters that the police were gone because it was Mother's Day, seeing their mothers, and they couldn't have helped prevent the violence that ensued. So many of these freedom riders were brutally beaten when, as soon as they arrived in Birmingham. Continuing on to Montgomery, they were met with similar violence. And as they reached Jackson, they were prepared for even more brutality to come. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, they were actually arrested as soon as they arrived in Jackson. And they remained incarcerated in Jackson until Robert F. Kennedy, with the help of Fred Shuttlesworth, got involved and made some uh, arrangements for them to be flown from Jackson to New Orleans, where although they weren't able to finish their journey physically via the trail they had set out for themselves to ride on the buses, they were able to finish their journey in New Orleans, which was a really important moment for the movement. And we see the success of the Freedom Rides because directly following that, the U.S. government does become involved in enforcing the ruling that interstate bus segregation is illegal. The Freedom Rides were far from the only important civil rights events which occurred in 1961. Here, we have federal judge Frank Johnson, who was described as Martin Luther King Jr. as the face of justice. Frank Johnson determined that discrimination was illegal in the South, setting an important precedent 
for the U.S. Constitution and U.S. laws to be upheld by the federal government within the South. Now we have the events of Albany, Georgia, which is a very important moment in the Civil Rights Movement as well as Martin Luther King Jr.'s story. Martin Luther King Jr. comes in to protest against segregation in Albany, Georgia, and for the first time he is faced with intelligent opposition. Lori Pritchard, the police commissioner for the city of Albany, tells Martin Luther King Jr., we're gonna leave you alone. For Martin Luther King Jr.'s movement to work, his nonviolent protests need to be met with violence. If nonviolence is ignored and it's pretended like it doesn't exist, then it has no real outcome. So what occurs in this city is Lori Pritchard and his police force ignore the nonviolent protesters. They say, you can do what you want, you can protest, but we're not gonna incite any violence. We're not gonna do anything to cause harm to you. And unfortunately for Martin Luther King Jr., it works very successfully. In the month span between November 17th and December 18th of that year, there are 500 arrests, which may sound like a large number singularly, but over that whole period of time, it's a very weak number to achieve for this movement. Martin Luther King Jr. leaves the city, he, he loses. And it's the first time that this occurs for Martin Luther King Jr. in this movement. And it raises a lot of questions across the nation amongst civil rights leaders and people who support the cause. A lot of people question whether Martin Luther King Jr. is the right leader for this movement, whether he has the oomph and the power to, to lead it and be the person to go to for everybody. And uh, we will see later that it turns out that this causes him to realize that he needs to keep working hard and fighting and improving for this movement to be a success. As a citizen in the United States, voting is very important. The 15th Amendment states, no matter your race, religion, or color, you shall not be denied the right to vote. Though this was an amendment, many states contradicted this law by using strategies such as the grandfather clause, which basically stated if you were granted the right to vote before 1867, you could continue to vote without the use of literacy tests. Literacy tests often included questions such as spell the word vote upside down but in correct order and spell the word backwards forward. This made voting for people of color relatively difficult because the 15th Amendment was not signed until 1870. And before 1870, it was illegal for a person of color to vote. During the summer of 1964, people went around trying to educate people of color on how to vote. Here we have a statue of a police officer who is blocking the doors of a courthouse, banning people of color from entering in order to vote. The legal age to vote in the United States is 18. Here you have a picture of an elderly woman voting for the first time. The struggle of voting led to people like Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, who famously stated, they can outlaw an organization, but they can't outlaw a movement of the people determined to be free. He created the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights because the NAACP was banned in the state of Alabama. This is a picture of the remaining pulpit and Bible that was left in Bethel Baptist Church after it was bombed. Here you have a picture of who became known as the Big Three, Fred Shuttlesworth, Ralph Abernathy, and Martin Luther King. This picture was taken after Fred Shuttlesworth invited Martin Luther King to come to Birmingham for the first time. Because you have three prominent leaders in the civil rights movement coming together, Birmingham, the world is watching. Birmingham, the world is watching. Beyond this point, there's two moves going on. The movement willing to change things and risk their lives, and the movement to not change things and willing to kill lives. Beyond this point, it's a bloodier and violenter fight between both movements, because it has gotten to the boiling point. Just as Courtney said, King is coming to Birmingham after his defeat in Albany, Georgia with Sheriff Lori Pritchett. He is proposing as a threat to black and white as black people see him as a failure and just wanna leave him up in Birmingham, leave them up in Birmingham with nothing done, while white people are seeing that this man is gonna start a roar in Birmingham and basically Alabama, and they do not want that to happen. They wanna keep things the same. So people like the National State Rights Party are sending messages to King that if he comes to Alabama, he will surely die, he will get hanged. He joined forces with Fred Shuttleworth and Rap Abernathy and create the Big Three. Out of the Big Three, they create Project C for confrontation. Project C is a joint operation between the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. This organization is the backing of many marches, protests, and sit-ins in Birmingham. 
Now, this organization at first wanted to have a parade permit to do this the legal way. But Bull Eugene Connor, who's right here in this narrative, is the antagonist, is being pushed in a corner as he loses his political gain in early 1963 against Albert Batwell as he loses power. So right now during this movement, he's doing everything he can. He's aggressive towards the movement. That's why in later events in this year, 1963, you'll see him hitting hard because he's trying to do everything he can to stay in power. So when Bull Connor denies their permit, they still go out and march. This march right here is called the Good Friday March. This Good Friday March was when Ralph Abernathy, Fred Shuttlesworth, and Dr. Martin Luther King all got arrested. Ralph Abernathy and Fred Shuttlesworth were released on bail. While Dr. King, he stayed in jail without bail for 11 days. Behind me are the original jail cell bars that Dr. King was held in. During this period of 11 days, Dr. King responded to the eight clergymen letter saying that his movement was untimely and unwise and they have handled it and they got it under control. But really all the eight clergymen was doing was slowing down the movement, but Albert Bout will have enough time to get in power and start something different with the movement. So Dr. King in jail wrote a 16 page essay, basically letter saying that this movement that you call untimely unwisely is a movement for change and that we're done waiting on you hand and foot to make a change about this harsh, brutal segregation in South and all over America. To write this letter, he used the edge of newspaper and toilet paper. Hey everyone, this is Sydney again, and right here we're going to talk about the Children's Crusade. On May 2nd, 1963, over a thousand students walk out of school, walk out of home, and start marching towards the mayor's office. This was the first day of the Children's Crusade. What you've seen in the galleries is a lot of adults and a lot of grown people working towards fighting the fight against segregation and racism, but we don't see a lot of children's moments. And this is, the Children's Crusade is one of the biggest moments in uh, the civil rights movement. Again, May 2nd, 1963, known as D-Day, was when a thousand students walked out of school, walked out of home, and started marching towards the mayor's office. There was no pushback from the city or city officials, but on the next day, double D-Day, that was when Bull Connor started to fight back. This is, um, this is the day where you see a lot of students and children getting hosed and bitten by dogs. And Double D Day was the biggest day that the Children's Crusade had. This was also the day and the time that national attention got, caught, got put on Birmingham. Um, the images of children getting hosed and getting bit by dogs and getting attacked for being a nonviolent protest would outrage the world. And this is what caused Birmingham to get so much attention. In local news, this event wasn't what was on the TV. It was basically on Bull Connor's dog who had gotten injured and his dog was a black dog who he had ironically named nigger. As you can tell, these children were very brave and fought hard for what they believed in. As you can see behind me, you see some pictures of these children waving out of the cars and the buses that they were arrested in. These children were arrested by in so many numbers that they had to be put on fairgrounds to be held captive in the jails. Um, in some of these other pictures, you have um, students and children just being happy and gleeful and just celebrating instead of the resorting to violence that they saw that happened on the same day. Hi, I'm Ella Francis. 1963 was probably the most difficult year of the entire civil rights movement. As you'll see on the timeline behind me, there's more black rectangles on this timeline than there have been on any of the others in the gallery. So the movement theoretically broke into two different movements in 1963. The first was led by a group of people who were willing to sacrifice their lives and die in order to make the necessary change and achieve equality, while the other movement was led by a group of people willing to take lives and kill other people in order to maintain the backward status quo that had been in effect for centuries before. So I'll start 1963 with George Wallace being inaugurated 
as the new governor of the state of Alabama, where he famously said, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. His statement will lay the foreground and expectation for the tension between those two movements that we will see in the year of 1963. As we move later into the year, you'll notice as the amount of violent events ramp up, whether it's a bombing or a murder or a rioting, the amount of media coverage is going to increase as well. So now the movement is on a world stage. It's moved from a local level to a national platform and everyone's watching. This is the perfect opportunity for something big. In August, we have the March on Washington in order to get the federal government's attention and really make a difference. The March on Washington was an extremely successful event. Anywhere from between a quarter of a million to half a million people attended. It was led by prominent civil rights leaders, most well known Dr. King, where he gave his I have a dream speech and others, whether they were Jews, Catholics, black, white, from the LGBTQ community, they had the power to change their communities for the future, and this was the place to do it. In August 1963, Fred Shuttlesworth helped Dwight and Floyd Armstrong enroll in Graymont Elementary, officially beginning the desegregation of Birmingham City Schools. Following this event, Bull Connor commented that the integration of Birmingham schools would cause blood to run in the streets of Birmingham. On the morning of September 15, 1963, the 16th Street Baptist Church received a call. A young girl, Carolyn McKinstry, picked up the phone. The words spoken to her were simple but terrifying. You have three minutes. Less than 30 seconds later, a bomb exploded outside the building. Most people in the church only sustained minor injuries because the church had very thick stone walls meant to prevent hate attacks like these from harming people who might be inside the church. However, the men who placed the bomb outside the church, four men, members of the Ku Klux Klan known as the Cahaba River Boys, had placed it behind some stairs right in front of a window that led to the basement in the church. Five girls had been sitting in the basement preparing for Sunday school that morning four of whom right by the, were right by the window. These four, Addie Mae Collins, age 14, Carol Robertson, age 14, Denise McNair, age 11, and Cynthia Wesley, age 14, all died that day. The fifth girl, Sarah Collins, Addie Mae's younger sister, was permanently blinded in the explosion. Three of the four girls had a funeral together where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered the eulogy. He said that these girls would become angels for change in the civil rights movement. Virgil Ware was killed by two 16-year-old Eagle Scout boys, Michael Farley and Larry Sims. Michael Farley and Larry Sims had just left a segregationist rally led by Reverend Griswold. They were riding down the road on a motorbike when they approached two young black boys of similar age. Larry Sims put out a pistol and fired, and Virgil Ware took two shots to the head and chest and died. Michael Farley and Larry Sims both confessed to the murder of Virgil Ware, but the judge said that these are two good, respectful young men, and they didn't serve a single day in prison. Johnny Robinson has a different story, but they definitely have similar outcomes. A group of white teenagers, teenagers were riding around in an old white Ford covered in Confederate symbols and a quote that said, Negroes go back to Africa. A group of blacks retaliated by throwing rocks at the car and the police were called. When the police arrived, the African-American group scattered and Officer Jack Parker fired a shotgun and hit Johnny Robinson in the back as he ran down an alleyway. He was dead upon arrival at Hillman Hospital. These are the final effects and the artifacts of the youngest of the four little girls, 11-year-old Denise McNair. You have her shoes, a charm bracelet with the Ten Commandments on it, a Bible, a coin purse, a necklace with a cross on it, a purse, and last but not least, you have a stone that was removed from her head in her autopsy. The bombing of 16th Street Baptist Church brought national attention to the city of Birmingham. From one bloody Sunday to another, here we have the Selma to Montgomery marches. Protesters 
marched from Selma to Montgomery across the Edmund Pettus Bridge across multiple days in March of that year. The first major event of these marches was Bloody Sunday, which occurred March 7th. On this day, as protesters crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge, they were faced with opposition from both KKK members, white citizens, and police officers. There, John Lewis was beaten brutally close to death, and it was that day that he became a prominent figure uh, historically, and Edmund Pettus Bridge was immortalized as a symbol of the civil rights movement. The next important event in the Selma to Montgomery marches was Turnaround Tuesday, which directly followed after Bloody Sunday. Instead of walking across the bridge, they stopped, kneeled there, and then turned around, ending the protest. The third and most successful of the Selma to Montgomery marches occurred after Frank Johnson, the face of justice, enforced that the National Guard come out and support the protesters who needed to be protected because they were expressing their First Amendment rights in the Constitution. As the National Guard helped them, they were finally able to complete their route from Selma all the way to Montgomery. Rain and shine over multiple days, they walked this route along the highway, they camped, they walked through the rain, they walked through the sunshine, and they were able to complete the full route. As the civil rights movement draws to a close in this era, there's an important thing we need to recognize about this timeline. If you look here, we have a lot of black uh, marks on the wall. What this means is people died. This is important because as this movement was drawing to a close and drawing to a close successfully, the counter movement of racism and white supremacy was growing more and more desperate. So when we look on this wall, we see that reflected. Here we have the death of Malcolm X, a civil rights leader who was murdered in New York City. We also have the death of Jonathan Daniels, a civil rights leader. There we have SNCC, three SNCC um, activists who were killed in the South. Later in 1968, we have the death of Martin Luther King Jr. in Memphis, which was a, a real blow to the civil rights movement and it prompted protests and riots across the United States and also made people realize that no matter what happens, no matter what laws are passed, there's still a, gonna always be a fight against racism, which is shown by his death. Two of the biggest acts we need to talk about that were passed is the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which effectively eliminates discrimination in the South. It reintegrates, it forces public housing, uh, jobs and uh, workplaces to be equal. And then we have the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which effectively eliminates poll taxes, literacy tests, and all the methods that were used by Southern states to delegitimize the black vote. And here we have the processional gallery. As you see by the statues, there are old, young, blue collar workers, white collar workers, students, and teachers. Everybody. This whole exhibit right here was supposed to represent Martin Luther King's dream. This overlooks Kelly Ingram Park, where thousands of young people marched to fulfill Martin Luther King's dream. It took every, everybody to fulfill Martin Luther King's dream. Thank you for coming to the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute.